Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Sheeli. The Muslim Muslim presidential ticket of the APC continues to generate reactions, with many arguing rightly that the issue is not about the qualification of both men to contest for office, but whether the move is in conformity with the constitutional principle on federal character. Many say that zoning is a product of federal character, while others argue that religion has nothing to do with federal character. This issue is the starting point of my conversation with Senior Advocate of Nigeria and Queen's Council, Professor Fidelis Odita. I think uh, from a legal point of view, there is perhaps nothing illegal with a Muslim Muslim ticket. The law is not a problem. And I don't see that this has anything to do with federal character because the federal character addresses the federal government, the state governments, and so on. Uh, as far as I'm aware, APC is not the federal government, uh, PDP is not the federal government, so it's doubtful whether those provisions apply to them, but that's at the level of law. At the level of fairness, equity, and morality, on the other hand, um, yes, the political parties are not bound by a federal character, but the federal character enshrines an important value to us as a nation, and therefore we all try to reflect the federal character in the things that we do. And one would expect major national parties to reflect the federal character, irrespective of whether or not the federal character principle in Section 14 is binding on them. So I find the choice of a Muslim Muslim ticket under the APC most unfortunate. And I find it really, really, really shameful that in the entire North, he could not find a single Christian in APC that could help him win the presidential election. That really says something about his own assessment and about the Northern Christians. I mean, some of them say, oh, it doesn't matter, um, religion, this is politics, it's not about religion. But our politics is very closely intertwined with religion. I also want to get your comments on the electoral process of especially the last two governorship elections that we saw that's talking about Ikiti and Oshun and the outcome. Let's evaluate the process as a means of strengthening the electoral system because now we hear about vote buying. What are your thoughts about that one? Yes, um, I think um, in general, uh, one has to be fairly happy with the electoral processes that we saw in Anambra State and uh, more recently in Oshun State. And why do I say that? First of all, we have this uh, BIVAS by modal uh, voter accreditation system, which appears to be working very well. It has solved a major problem, which is the manual accreditation, where people just write up uh, uh, accredit their friends, accredit rats, rabbits, chickens, and then produce fake results. So the beavers has brought the chickens home to roost. And we saw what it did in Anambra State, where, for example, Mr. Anduba, who claimed that he had over 220,000 votes in the APC primaries, could not get up to 100,000. If only 50% of those delegates who allegedly voted for him to be their candidate had turned up, he would have become the governor. But the difference between their primaries and the actual election was beavers. People ran away. So also we saw in Osho. I mean, the total number of votes, less than 800,000. And of course, they wanted to do the magic of 2018, inconclusive election. But so the process is good, the beavers, and also strengthening the the legal framework to a degree by saying, well, we only, for purposes of having runoffs and inconclusive election, we are only interested in those accredited, not those on the register, because clearly those on the register might include my dad who has died, might include my children who have, run, who have gone away or they are holiday or they are somewhere. The voter register is simply not the point. It's the number of people who presented themselves for voting on the day of election. So to that extent, the process appears to be working reasonably well. And the fact that these uh, results are now transmitted to an INEX server that we they now say they have, whether it is in the cloud or wherever it is, it means that 
we are all armed to access the results real time, which prevents the rigging that one sees from one point, from the point of um, voting to the point of commission. So to that extent, the system is um, improving, but the system is not self-executing. The system requires human beings to execute, and that's where this voter buying and minor irregularities arise. Why would there not be voter buying? In America and the UK, when they were at this comparable point that we are, the people were buying votes. It's all about poverty. The politicians have weaponized poverty. The people have been wholly impoverished. They see nothing of a government, and therefore they see this as the opportunity to get something. It's all very well for us to tell them that uh, if they collect one or two thousand, they will suffer for the next four years. If they don't collect, they will suffer. If they collect, they will suffer. So they have to collect. Of course, we need to do something to stop and to penalize people who pay them, not the people who collect. Because the people who collect are already victims of a system that has weaponized poverty. I don't think, for example, INEC should be given the burden of prosecuting. Come on, what does the police exist for? These are crimes, electoral offenses. Why can't the police um, prosecute those people? If they have insufficient prosecutors, why can't they appoint additional prosecutors? We don't need to create, uh, to, to burden INEC with having to prosecute. So INEC is now the electoral umpire. In addition to that, it now becomes an investigator and a prosecutor. No. INEC should provide the evidence of wrongdoing, and then the law enforcement agency should enforce our laws by taking those people to court. But we have seen both, uh, we lack institutional capacity to enforce our laws, uh, and that is why we're having this conversation. If this happened in the UK or in the United States, you'll be sure that they will prosecute them, because those prosecutors have the capacity to take on politicians. But here, when the policeman who should arrest them is carrying the bag with which they are going to bribe, who is going to enforce your laws for you? Let's also talk about the role of the judiciary, especially in the electoral system. When you recall how the immediate past CJN left office and that um, infamous letter by 14 justices of the court complaining about the conditions of service at that court and welfare issues and all of that. How can the judiciary win the confidence of Nigerians and the electorate, especially as we're going into election season? Most people who have engagement with the court will never get to the Supreme Court. The judiciary is about all levels of decision making, the magistrate courts, the customary courts, the area courts, the high courts, the court of appeal, and the Supreme Court. So I don't want us to get distracted with the welfare politics of the Supreme Court. And they are complaining about not having diesel or rationing diesel. That is not our problem. The fact that they should even be talking about that is itself disgraceful. You cannot hear the UK justice of the Supreme Court or the United States Justice of the Supreme Court, to whom they like to benchmark themselves, complaining about such quasi stomach infrastructure. That's not what it's about. We're talking about a system that has to inspire confidence in the users of that, because the courts are a public resource. And people say the judiciary is the last hope of a common man. I don't know whether people still feel that way. But a system that you want to engage, you must feel some level of confidence in that system. But that's not about the Chief Justice of Nigeria. It's about all the apparatus of <coughs> dispute resolution through the courts. It's about the judges. It's about the registrars. It's to give people confidence that this system is not completely broken, is not completely corrupt it will work. In saying that, there are a good number of judges, magistrates, who are doing their best to make this system work. And I know a number of them, and I commend them. But at the same time, there are major, major problems. As I always say, the entire problem we have in Nigeria can be reduced to three things at the level of the courts. The first, the lack of institutional capacity, both human and infrastructural. Secondly, the 
lack of cooperation between the major stakeholders, the litigants themselves, the lawyers, and the judges. And three, the method of appointment of these judges. If you take the first one, the lack of institutional capacity, how much, what is the funding? I'm not even talking about the salaries of the judges. How much do we allocate to the courts? What is the ratio of litigants to judges? If you know any judge that has less than 20,000 cases on his or her docket, you can tell me. So what type of justice system are you going to produce where you give one person 10 or 20,000 cases? When in this life are they going to finish with that? So you have a problem first of lack of capacity. The system simply, there they aren't just enough courts to deal with. You can't just have these few people and you give someone 10,000 cases, you give someone 20,000 cases. How are they going to deal with it? They can't. So we need to begin to understand the problems. These judicial, I mean, the National Assembly and the executive who do pretty little and take all the money and then give very little to the the courts. And then when they get to their own matter, they make changes to the constitution and give themselves priority. So in a few months, all we'll be doing is election. And we'll do the elections for two years. Everything else will suffer. Criminal justice, civil justice, the judges won't even be there. Many of them will say they've gone for tribunal duty. They will adjourn these cases so that you have a complete backlog because you have a six or nine month period where mo most judges, not all of them, are on election duty to elect how many people? How many are they? At all levels. So the whole country is beholden to a few people. And they are the ones that allocate the money and they give very little to the courts. And the little they give to the courts, they complain that the senior judge, the chief justice has stolen most of it. That's what he's what his mates were complaining. So you have a system that first is inadequate and the little that they have given them, they've stolen, which is both a problem of ethics, morality, criminality, all wrapped into one. So, and that's why I keep saying, no matter what you do, even if you give them more money, the money is not going to spend itself. People are going to spend it. We've known cases where chief judges or, or chief judges or chief judges when they are retiring, they take monies that are meant for the cause to go and build themselves houses. In this country, nothing has happened to them. Prof, let's round off talking about the role that the Nigerian Bar Association should be playing. We recently elected new national officers. What can they do to move us forward? I think, first of all, that the Bar should try and reinforce the rule of law. Because that is really a watershed concept for everybody. When you have rule of law, to ensure that people are governed by laws. The bar is not, of course, the judges and the legal practitioners are all members of the bar, but that is where we must start. We must, as a, as, uh, <coughs> of course, is a, is a tra <laughs> I don't want to call it a trade union, but the MBA is like a trade union, isn't it? Where we're all members and the first thing that you should do is that it should try to encourage the rule of law. Unfortunately for us, we have had uh, leaders in the past who have been embroiled in all sorts of difficulties, but the MBA can also very problem. So they can do rule of law. The MBA can become more active in the selection of judges. They are not in the statutory uh, framework. There is nowhere which gives them a role to play. But as the umbrella association, they are very influential. They can give themselves additional role. And we have to encourage the judges who are there to respect the views of the MBA. In most cases, they're not respected. I saw the last, uh, the current leadership that is going out in, um, in August, they tried. And I think, in fairness to them, you say that for the first time, you saw an MBA that was fairly independent, took on active intervention in areas where the MBA should be intervening, and you saw the role they played in the selection of judges and so on. We need that agenda to continue. But beyond that, I don't think MBA has uh, any additional role to play. I hear people in the public say, 
when this is happening, what should the NBA do? They can come to court as an amicus, as a friend of the court, to present a brief. And perhaps they should do more of that in public interest litigation to reflect the views of the association. But this is where the judges might not accept what they are saying, but at least they should do more of that to try and make the MBA. Um, and in order for, of course, to fulfill that role, you have to elect people of integrity and character because otherwise they become themselves vulnerable to abuse by the system.